Grandma's 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 Grandma's
the recipe is from a faithful follower and that is Tracy McGuire. Hi, Tracy. And I told her I'd be using her recipe because I, uh, we were chit chatting. I chit chat a lot with some of you through email or the private messages on Facebook. So I, I, I feel like I know you all. And she knew that Leslie Crew was coming on this day. And I say, well, I'm, I've never made lemon curd before and I've made scones lots of times. But uh, it's so nice to get those recipes shared. So thank you, Tracy, for sharing this. And it's a really easy recipe, and we've enjoyed it all week long. And the blueberry scone recipe is from Krista Bolt out there in BC. Hi, Krista. I'm using your recipe today, and it's, it is a delicious recipe. So thank you very much. So people, I'm going to put the camera down. I'm just going to show you how we can get ready before we go to the stove. So you're going to, I'm going to put the camera down. Yeah. Hi, Bertha. Okay. There we go. So we're going to start. We're going to measure out everything and have everything ready before we, we go over to the stove. So um, we, I'm already pre-measured this. It's four tablespoons of butter, and then once you measure out your four tablespoons of butter, you um, cut it up into little pieces. And we'll be adding that to the lemon curd after we take it off the heat, and just a little bit by little bit. Now you can have the, the butter right out of your refrigerator if you like it, or at room temperature. Mine is at room temperature, all right? And my eggs have already been out uh, room temperature as well, okay? But uh, if it's not, it's not. And that's all there is to it, and that's fine. So, <clears throat> the, the next part we're going to, I'm going to put right into the pot here, uh, the four eggs that we're gonna need. We're going to need one whole egg, and we're going to need three egg yolks, all right? Now, when I crack open the egg, and you know when you put an egg in, you know that little mucousy membrane that is in there? Uh, that's called uh, chalazi. That's plural. Chalaza is, is one. But the chalazi are, are many, and we'll be removing them with the eggshell because when, they, when you start cooking with the uh, egg white and, and uh, the egg yolk, that little membrane keeps the two of them together and, and, and keeps the egg yolk safe inside the egg, but it'll cook up as a big white chunk and you don't want that. So, uh, but if you happen to, to leave some of that egg, that, that little caleza in there, um, you can always pick it out with a spoon or you can put your, all of your lemon curd through um, a sieve to make sure that you get that out because you just want a nice clean lemon uh, uh, curd coming out. So I'm going to um, just put this, the whole egg in and see if I can do this. You can really can only get that glaze out with the shell. And you gotta chase it around the, the, <laughs> the bowl, the pot to get it out. And I'm not doing so well here. Just a minute. I'm going to be doing this for every one of them. This is just, it never gave me this much trouble when I was making it this week. There, okay, there's one. And there's usually a couple. Okay. And now, I'm gonna do this like this. So I'm gonna separate it into a bowl now because I only need the yolk. And sometimes you can just get it when you're uh, putting it from one to the other. That shell is what you want to use to get it, get rid of it. There it is. Okay. And 
this is what gives the um, the curd the nice yellow color. All right, I think I got it all. And one more. Got it. I think I have it all out. There might be a little piece in there. Got it. All righty. Now, I forgot to wash my hands. Going over to the sink, going to wash my hands, and uh, it's a good thing I waited because I'm full of egg. And it's not on my face. <laughs> so I am just going to stir that up now. This is a great little whisk. Pan for Jack. But it's just perfect for this. Or you can use your big whisk and really mix it up well. See that. Okay. And you're going to put a half a cup of sugar in there. Half a cup of sugar. Mix that up. And now you are going to do your lemon zest. So I'm going I'm going to zest this lemon. Um, I'm going to do the whole thing, but it really only going to use about a teaspoon of it. I'm not sure. What does it say? from one teaspoon to one tablespoon. So you decide. Make sure that when you zest your lemon that don't get any of the white stuff because that's really bitter. You just want the yellow. Can you see that? Okay. Mary Janet, you need to take the thing off the zester. Okay, we're good. This lemon is fairly large, so we should be getting a lot of juice out of it. And people say that if you rest your lemon in a bowl of warm to hot water, that it you'll get even more juice. Never done that. And I washed these lemons ahead of time. So I hope you did that too. So, you can see that all assessed. And I'm really only going to put about a teaspoon in there. Or whatever you want. If you want more lemony flavor, that's up to you. And now we're going to get the juice of the lemon. So I don't know what kind of juicer you guys have at home. This is my old one. It works just fine. Just have a bowl underneath it and twist your lemon on top of it. But you know Tammy. You know she sells Pampered Chef.
So she she sent me their uh, juicer. So that's what I'm going to be using. So this is what it looks like. You put the lemon in there like that. This is a large lemon too. And then you close it and you get all the juice out. And if I do it right, it'll be inside out when I take it off. And I'm sure it's not going to do that, but lots of juice. Okay. No, oh, it kind of did. Boy. And it takes the seeds out as well. And the other half. It, you should get about a quarter of a cup of juice from a lemon, a big lemon like this. That's good. All right. Let's see what this lemon, no, it's not that much, not, not a quarter cup. They're different. It still tastes just as good. So we're gonna mix that up. All right, I'm gonna take you over to the stove. I'm gonna take my butter. Do I need something else? Well, we'll figure it out. How's everybody? Hi. I gotta see you for a minute. There. Hello. I keep freezing today. Ah, I'm sorry about that. It's nice and sunny here. <laughs> I don't know why I'm frozen. <laughs> okay. And yes, you can squeeze the lemon by hand. That's just fine. All right, so I brought my butter over that I'll be putting into the lemon uh, curd when it's done. A must-have tool in the kitchen. Yes. Okay, I'm going to turn you down to the stove. And we're going to... Look... Can you see in the pot here? We'll go bring you up closer. There, that's a better view. How's that? So the recipe says, cook until the mixture is thickened and it's gonna be about two and a half to three minutes and then remove it from the heat. From the heat and we're gonna add the butter then. This makes about a cup of lemon curd. And lemon curd can be used for anything you want. It's all, it's, you can use it like a jam. You could put it in a little bottle in your fridge and have a teaspoon on your toast. There's lots of, lots of things that you can use it for. Now I'm gonna turn this on. It only takes two and a half minutes till this is uh, thickened. Did you keep, keep whisking the whole time. I'm gonna set the timer for three minutes just so I know how long it's taking. But I'm pretty sure the other day when I made it, it was around two and a half minutes. I know some of you are saying that it's freezing, but you know, um, it's not freezing here, so I can't, I can't help you out. I'm just gonna keep on going. From Whispering Hills, Alberta. We are not getting any snow here, not at all. Hi, 
Kelly. I see my daughter Kelly is watching. And there's Wavy Flynn from Newfoundland. So this is on a medium, medium high, I would say, on my stove. Okay, so somebody suggested there for you to um, come, go out and come back in, I guess, and refresh your 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 screen. Your screen. Okay, look at this. It's almost it's almost ready already. I'm gonna just turn that down a little bit. And I'm gonna get my spatula. So oh, it's nice and thick already. Can you see that? That didn't take very long at all. So now we're going to add the butter. One little bit at a time. Until it's melted. Hope I'm doing it right, Tracy. If you're watching today, your recipe. Since mine is at room temperature, it's taking a very short time to melt in. Depends on what you are. If you're using cold butter, it's probably going to take longer. So I'm, uh, what I'm going to do as soon as this is done, I am going to uh, set my oven to 400 for the scones. And this is going to be going into the fridge. And you want it to be um, cold when, it, you're being, when you're serving it. Yeah. What it tastes like is a very tart lemon pie filling. It's uh, it's delicious, it really is, and, and it's my probably my second time tasting it. Bernice, did we did we have this when we went to Harrods in in London? Did they serve lemon curd there? I can't remember. Well, I can't remember if the, if we had it at Harrods when we went. We went for tea in the afternoon at Harrods. That was our treat, and. Um, but then my sister-in-law, Rita Lahey McDonald, who lives in Michigan, she had lemon curd and clotted cream and scones one time. That was my first time trying it. We were being very fancy. And it was so, oh, got it. And um, it was delicious. So this is fun. And I really thought it was going to be a big do to try to, to make it, but this recipe was so easy. Okay, that's the last of the butter. It smells amazing. If you love lemon, you're gonna love this. Okay. All right. I'm just going to put this in a bowl. Just like that. And we're going to put a little piece of saran wrap over the surface. When you put the saran wrap on it, let it touch the surface. So you don't want that skin to form on it. And 
there's your lemon curd. We're being so gorgeous like Emmeline. We're just being fancy. All right, I'm gonna put that in the fridge. It really, it smells delicious. It's really, really good. And now set your ovens to 400. This is what it says. I licked the spoon and, and kept using it. <laughs> well, you know what? I'd lick the spoon, but I wouldn't keep using the spoon. But I thought, oh my God, this is too funny. Okay. Uh, no, you don't want a skin to form. You don't want that the skin to form at all. Okay. All right. Gosh, I don't know why people are freezing. I'm just, I can't do anything about that. It's probably something to do with our internet here. I don't know. But I'm not freezing on the screen, and usually I'm the one that does it. <laughs> okay. So I'm getting my blue ball. And we're going to make scones, okay? All right. So there we go. So the scones. Scones, scones. I'm not sure which way to pronounce it. I'm, it's all, it's all good. So we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is the cest and the, and the sugar. So um, <clears throat> we need a half a cup of sugar. And about a teaspoon of zest. I'm just gonna put that in there. Ah, I might as well use the whole thing. All right. And I'm just going to mix that with my hands. I'm just going to mix that. There. Perfect. All right. Put that aside. And we're going to get the dry ingredients ready. Okay. Two cups of all-purpose flour. One. Two. A tablespoon of baking powder. Oh my God, I have a funny story to tell you. I can't say who did this. <laughs> I'm, I, it's just, it kills me. I'm, I'm laugh, I still laugh so hard just thinking about this. A friend of mine made the custard and she got everything ready ahead of time and, and uh, had it on the stove and it bubbled up all over you know I said well you must have had the heat on too high so she threw everything away and she started all over again <laughs> it was worse the second time because the pot was still kind of hot and it went up all over everywhere and she was on a timeline <clears throat> wondering what in the name of God did I do wrong and she looked at the ingredients and she looked at this whatever it just wouldn't work and then she said well I have to get this custard made because I need it and she looked and instead of cornstarch, she was using her baking powder. <laughs> and then her recipe, and of course the baking powder was gonna make a massive mistake by boiling everything over. But I, I, every time I touch my baking powder now, I think of her. I won't, I won't call her out on that though. Okay, back we go. So in here, two cups of flour and a tablespoon of uh, baking powder, and um, a half a teaspoon of salt. So, you know what a half a teaspoon of salt looks like. There we go. 
and just mix that around. Okay. And to that, you're going to add a half cup of butter, either cold or room temperature. I'm at room temperature. If you're using cold butter, you probably have to cube it up and use a um, pastry blender there. All right. And uh, you're going you're gonna to mix this up until it's crumbly. Using your hands if you like. Okay, it's looking good. Just mix it up until it's nice and crumbly. There you go, see that? Nice and crumbly. All right. And you're gonna make a well. And in a bowl, Wait, I'm gonna go wash my hands, okay? I'm going to use my little whisk again. <clears throat> You're not worried about the Kaleza for this. Put that aside. So in here, you're going to put an egg and a half a cup of whipping cream. And you can also use coffee cream. You could use buttermilk. You can use that blend cream if that's what you have. This makes it a little uh, richer. The whipping cream is your highest percentage of fat. And don't we all need that? Okay, I'm just gonna mix that up. Put that into your little well that you made. Okay, and I'm going to get a fork. mix it until the dough is pretty well formed. And just bring it together with your hands till it's not completely into a dough ball because you have to add the blueberries. I think that's just about right. And now you're going to add your cup of blueberries. These are giant blueberries. And you're just going to get them in there using your hands and bring it into a dough. or whatever, you know, some people can use cranberries if they like. Did I 
forget, I did. I'm sorry, people. I forgot. <laughs> I forgot the sugar and the lemon. We'll just have to add that now, see how it comes out. I'm sure it'll be fine. We didn't get it totally into the dough. Okay, there we go. That's lucky. All right. I was wondering why I wasn't smelling the lemon. Well, I hope that they'll be okay without that. There. Okay, we're gonna roll this out. And we're gonna put a little flour here. And you're going to roll it out till it's about an inch in diameter. In, in height, I'm short, I'm sorry, in height. Let me get my rolling pin. Now, I think that's about right, but you're gonna tidy up the edges so that they're nice and round. So that's, that's rolled out to about a, a nine inch, nine and a half inch circle. All right, now I'm gonna get my pan together here. Bernice, I'm doing everything backwards today. It's because you did <laughs> I'm gonna use my stoneware pan. That's what I like to make my biscuits on. So, and I'm going to put some parchment paper on here. Okay, now you're gonna cut it like a pie. Cut it down the center and across. And then evenly into the pie shape. All eight should fit on your cookie sheet. There's a little residue of the um, cream in here, and you can, or you don't have to, but you can just brush the top with a little bit of the cream if you so desire, but you don't have to. 
just makes it a little more brown. And the ones in the picture that I posted this week, I actually had forgotten to, to brush them with cream, but they turned out just fine. And the color was fine, so you don't have to do that. Okay. And we're gonna put that in the oven for 18 to 20 minutes. So I'm gonna put it in for 18. I'll put it in for 18 and we'll check. And then, let's look Okay. So there. Now there is a glaze that you can make if you want to have glaze on top. Um, I'm going to opt out of that feature today because I think the lemon curd is just enough. But uh, it's the the juice off one lemon and um, the um, the the rind, the zest, and a cup of icing sugar. You mix that up, and when they're at room temperature, we'll, we'll, uh, you can put the glaze over it, but then you have to let that set for a while till it kind of gets firm and set before you can serve it. So we don't have time to do that today, and uh, we're just gonna do it this way. So, I'll check back with you. So today, we have the lovely Leslie Crew with us today. I'm gonna bring you around to her. And uh, she, for those who may not know who Leslie Crew is, well, after Christmas, I had finished reading another one of her novels and I just loved it as I did most of the ones that I had read uh, in her collection. And um, I just showed it to, to you guys on, on, uh, after I had finished reading it and so many of you were already Leslie Crew fans, but some of you didn't know who she was and you were so excited to find that there was a new author and she's lived in Cape Breton for over 40 years and her and John live over uh, on the other side of the island from us. So I was so happy that she was able to make the, the trek and visit us today. And uh, her, her books, a lot of her books are set in Cape Breton and the latest one, The Spoon Stealer, was just such a, uh, a great read. It took me just two days to, to do that. And um, so she's going to read a, a little portion, about 10 or more minutes uh, uh, from her book. And uh, I want to welcome Leslie. There she is. Hello. <laughs> so I am going to do this, Leslie. And I'm going to pull it maybe a little closer to you. Christ, not too close. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we don't need to see in all my windows. We are um, just just so everybody knows, we we are uh, social distancing and being very careful to follow the rules and uh we couldn't hug but no. uh that's okay we're we're being smart and uh oh lots of fans out there all the hearts are coming oh. <laughs> <laughs> there's 727 people watching oh thanks a lot <laughs> <laughs> i just Holy happened moly. to notice that <laughs> Oh, Hello, great. Leslie. I just started my first book of yours last night, The Spoon Stealer. Yay. So lots of fans out there. Okay. So, uh, Leslie, I'd just like to talk to you for a minute before yeah, you yeah. start. What, what started you in writing? I just wanted to write a story for myself. I never envisioned ever getting published or ever doing anything like that. It was just a story I wrote down in our basement in, in an old bathrobe <laughs> because it was cold down there. And... Um, yeah, so that was it. And then I just, I liked that, so I wrote another one. And then it was uh, my sister suggested I send it off to somebody. And I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't really planning on it. But I did, and they wanted it, and that was it. That was just that's the that's start. as much as it, I know. It's just, it's always been like a, a lovely little hobby for me, something to do. And, you know, I rug hook, 
I write. I uh, don't do housework. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it. Just started for no other reason than I just wanted to write something for myself. Yeah. Yeah. That that's was it. wonderful. Well, I won't take you uh, away from this and let you carry on from here. Okay. And I'll sit in the kitchen. All right. Uh, well, Mary Janet asked me to come in and uh, tell you about the Spoon Stealer. This is my, I'm trying to remember, this is my 12th novel. Um, and I wrote it last year. Uh, well, I wrote it, I wrote it from November to January. And I, our little granddaughter was going to be born at the end of January. And I finished this on January 15th and she was born on the 19th. So I, oh, I got it done because I knew the minute she was born, that was it. I wasn't going to think about anything else but her. Um, but I, I wanted, I, this idea of this Mary Poppins kind of character kept uh, running through my head. And I wanted it to be a little bit of magic too. Um, and oh, I'll tell you about the other thing later. Um, I just, I just knew who she was like right from the beginning. This, this book is about a woman named Emmeline Darling. She's born in 1894. You meet her in 1968. She was born in Pictou County. Well, she was born, if any of you have driven from Sydney to Halifax, and you go by Marshy Hope, there's a little farmhouse there with a big barn in the back and two beautiful horses that are always in a field. And everybody I mention that to, they all say, I know the place, I know those horses, oh my God. Well, the house doesn't look exactly as I describe it in the book, but that's the setting I envisioned. Every time I go by that house, she's got a clothes on the clothesline. And I thought, okay, I need a farmhouse. This is the little farmhouse that I want for my story. Uh, if anybody ever knows who lives there, please know if it wasn't for COVID, I would have gone up their driveway and just said, hello, I put your uh, house in my book. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so that's that's basically why I put it. Everybody says, why did you put it in Picto County? I really don't know a whole lot about Picto County, but I thought, well, I'll have it there. So this story, she's, she's brought up on a farm uh, in that little spot, but she ends up spending most of her life in England, and you're going to meet her in England uh, when she is uh, 73 uh, years old. Uh, it's about her life and what happens to her, um, and you learn about her, her earlier life when she joins a memoir writing class. And we, you know, she tells the her fellows, memoir people there, um, you know, she reads a chapter every so often and that's how you get to know what happened to her when she was young. And then about halfway through the book, she uh, unexpectedly inherits the family farm and she wants to go over to Canada to meet the family that she's uh, never met. So that's basically the story. But a few things in the story are based on uh, our family history, my uh, grandfather's uh, siblings in the First World War. So the book means a great deal to me. Um, and it was very odd that uh, I would be talking about the First World War and the uh, pandemic <laughs> when these things happened in 1919 and I was writing it in 2019 having no idea that a pandemic was crawling over the earth because in January 2020 we didn't know we didn't know until March so it was very it was very scary almost that when I realized uh, what the timing of this book um, but anyway so Emmeline she's my favorite character uh, she's a big gal I wonder how I got that idea. Uh, and uh, so we're just going to introduce, uh, I'm going to introduce you to her. And this is one of my favorite parts. This was my, uh, one of my favorite parts to write. So when she retired in 1960, her plan was to move to a quiet village and putter, which always sounded delightful when someone else said it. Oh, I just love puttering around in my garden. I enjoy puttering in the shed. It's so relaxing to putter up in the attic. But it turned out that puttering wasn't her strong suit. So she decided to enlist in the Women's Institute, a stalwart and capable organization of good deeds and noble intentions. But no, but you can only talk to a WI member for so long before their earnestness wears you down. After eight months, Emmeline developed hives. She spent money on creams and lotions and wondered if she had developed an allergic reaction to wool 
which would have been devastating considering her wardrobe. The, family, the penny finally dropped at a WI meeting when the secretary announced that while she knew Emmeline was in charge of the bake sale and the crocheted washcloth drive, would it be possible to organize the elder care agenda at the seniors facility and write out applications for government funding at the local school milk program by this coming Wednesday? When Miss Darling didn't answer, the secretary looked up from her roster to see Emmeline ripping and scratching at the collar of her blouse, her neck a rather nasty shade of purpley red. Are you all right, the secretary asked. To be honest, I think I'm dying, Emmeline choked out. Good heavens, someone call an ambulance. No, really, I just need some air. But thank you for your concern, but I will be as right as rain in no time. And she scurried out of the room and never went back. Emmeline did keep herself busy in those early years with soup kitchens and volunteering with Meals on Wheels, taking pottery and painting classes and chuckling over P.G. Woodhouse novels, but one night as she brushed her teeth, she looked in the mirror and said, admit it, Emmeline, you're lonely. So now she had to figure out what to do about it. So this is what she did. The, wait now. She went for a long walk down Lee Hall Road and every day after took a different route. It was satisfying to look into people's front windows as she strolled by. She was by nature a very nosy person. The first morning Emmeline saw Vera. She was draped over the back of a sofa that must have been up against the sitting room wall under the window. This little white dog looked sad. So sad she didn't even raise her head to look back at Emmeline. Something about it didn't feel right and Emmeline couldn't get the dog out of her mind that night. The next day she went directly to the house and the dog was in the same position. She waved to get its attention. The dog's eyes looked up for a few moments but then closed again with no expression. The day after that, the dog raised its head to look at her. And the following day, its curved stick-like tail gave two thumps. 24 hours later, the dog was standing on the sofa waiting for her to show up. Well, that's it, Emmeline cried. Something must be done. She marched up to the front door and she rang the doorbell. No one answered. She rang again. No response. Now a flutter of panic seized her. This time she knocked very sharply. It was more of a thumping, really. The door opened slowly. A small elderly lady peeked out. What do you want? Oh, thank heavens, I'm so glad to meet you. I'm Emmeline Darling. What? I'm Emmeline Darling. What? I can't hear you. I'm a bit deaf. Emmeline raised her voice. May I please come in and talk to you? It's about your dog. What dog? Well, this is worse than she suspected. Emily reached into her tote and took out a package of peak cream assorted cream biscuits she'd picked up earlier on her jaunt. Emmeline shouted, I'll come in and make you a lovely cup of tea and then we'll have some biscuits. Would you like that? The old lady's eyes lit up. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> when Emmeline crossed the threshold, she took in the situation instantly. This wizened old lady needed help. The place was a tip and the smell of cigarette smoke was overpowering. Even the walls were the color of nicotine. Emmeline shook her hand and yelled, I'm Emmeline, what's your name? Enid Bent. Well, Enid, let's go to the sitting room and I'll get you settled and make the tea. She wanted to steer her into the front room for one reason only, to see the dog. Enid sat in what was her usual spot, judging by the medicine bottles, various dishes and dirty ashtrays piled up around it. The dog was on the back of the sofa. Her tail wagged as Emmeline went over and held her hand for the dog to sniff. Then she reached out and softly patted between her ears. Hello, sweetheart. What a lovely dog you are. She turned to Enid and yelled, is this your dog, Enid? I don't think so. Enid reached for a cigarette, lit it, shook the match and threw it on the floor amongst a pile of newspapers. Deaf, forgetful and an arsonist. I'll go make the tea and we'll have a long talk about the dog, Enid. What dog? Back in a moment, Emmeline followed. When Emmeline went down the hall to the kitchen, the dog followed her, which gave her a chance to give the small creature a real look. She was a short hair, completely white, with small black eyes and a black nose and muzzle. She was low to the ground and had the shape of a dachshund and the facial features of a chihuahua. Dear old ratty from Wind in the Willows sprang to mind. 
She was charmingly bow-legged, and when Emmeline held out her fingers, the dog lifted her front paws and held on, as if to shake hands, and then gave Emmeline a big grin, showing all her perfect little teeth, tops and bottoms. Never in her life had Emmeline ran into such an enchanting creature. She looked at that face and that grin and was in love. Oh my, oh my, you just bear with me and I'll see what I can do about this situation. Emmeline straightened up and looked around. What a mess. And oh dear, in the corner by the back door was wet newspaper with dog poo on it. You don't even go outside, you dear little thing. Right, this is not going to continue. Emmeline found a kettle and filled it with water, then rummaged through the cupboards for a couple of teacups and a plate. When she opened the cutlery drawer, she immediately looked at the spoons. Lots of ordinary ones, but she picked up one with a darker patina than the rest. You've been around, haven't you? I wonder where. Tea made, she and the dog went back to the sitting room. Emmeline gave Enid her tea and opened the package of pea greens and offered her a selection on a plate. Enid grabbed two shortbreads, which caused the ash from her cigarette to fall on the biscuits. Oh, ta! Enid sipped her tea. You make a good cuppa. Emmeline stirred her tea with the dark spoon. Where did you get this spoon from, Enid? Spoon? What spoon? Emmeline showed it to her. Oh, that! Harold said he nicked it from the war rooms. Said Churchill used to stir his tea with it. But Harold was always kidding around. You could never believe a word he said. Emmeline knew spoons. Something told her Harold was telling the truth about this one. Oh dear. She obviously had no self-control in these matters. She quickly slipped it into her pocket. It was coming home with her. And so was the dog. She took a piece of biscuit and fed the little friend at her feet. She was just about to launch into the reason why she was there when she heard someone unlatch the front door. Only me, a woman crawled out. Enid didn't hear her. A woman who looked like she had three jobs and no time for any of them burst into the sitting room and did a double take. Who the bloody hell are you? Emmeline stood up. Oh, I'm ser terribly sorry to startle you. I'm Emmeline Darling and I've just given your mother a cup of tea and a biscuit. She ain't my mother. She's my mother-in-law. And now that my miserable husband is dead, this is what he left me with. I swear he did it on purpose. Well, I'm sorry about your husband, but I thought I might be able to help with the situation. What do you want about? I could take the dog. The dog? Yes, it's obvious your mother-in-law can't cope with looking after her, and you certainly have more than enough on your plate. I got that dog to keep her company. She turned to her mother-in-law and shouted, I got that dog for you, didn't I? What dog? said Enid. Oh, hell's bell, she can't remember a thing. Look, I don't mean to criticize, but the last thing you need when you come into this house is cleaning up dog poo in the kitchen, not to mention the expense of dog food. And if your mother-in-law isn't even aware the dog is here, I'm prepared to take her off your hands. You're not some nutter, are you? Of course not. I'm a respectable woman. I'd like to offer the dog a happy home. Why her? She's no oil painting, is she? Well, neither am I, so we're perfect for each other. And what do we get out of it? Emmeline grabbed her wallet out of her pocket. She held up two five-pound notes just inches away from the woman. And you can keep the peak freens. Done. Emmeline didn't give the woman a chance to change her mind. She stuffed her wallet back in her pocket, picked up her dog, and sprinted to the door. Goodbye, Mrs. Ben, she bellowed. I'll take good care of your dog, I promise. What dog? The minute she got outside, Emmeline hurried as fast as she could up the street with the little bundle safely tucked up in her arms in case the woman chased after them. God, she wheezed, that was a caper. I didn't even know that woman's name. Her name's Dora, said the dog. She's a real piece of work. Emmeline stopped and held up the dog in front of her. Are you talking to me? And with a voice that sounds like a throaty lounge singer, no less? You inhale three packs of ciggies a day and see what happens to your voice. And I can't tell you what a relief it is to chat with someone who isn't dead from the neck up. Could you be any more wonderful? Please tell me your name. It's Vera. Harold was in love with the singer Vera Lind. I would be too if I was married to Enid. Dora apparently thought it was hysterical to name me after Enid's rival. Does Dora know you can talk? As if I'd waste my breath on that one. She's daft. Oh, Vera, you and I are going to be best friends. Now let's go to the shops and buy you a lead and then I can take you a proper walk in the fresh air. A couple of months later, Emmeline ran into Dora on the street. She asked after Enid. 
Get this, Dora said. I finally get the old coot settled into a nice nursing home and she up and dies two days later. How's that for gratitude? Emmeline went home and told Vera about it over supper. They both shuddered as Emmeline stirred her tea with Churchill's spoon. <laughs> so, that's Emmeline and Vera, they're best friends. <laughs> and I was hoping people would be go with me with the talking dog and they did. And they did, <laughs> I know. I, I, it took me a couple of pages to realize that Vera was the dog. <laughs> And oh, I just, I just loved it. I loved it. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. Now I took my um, scones out at 18 minutes and they were perfectly done. I'll, I'll bring them over so you can see. And you left the camera on my lap, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the hands of a writer. And there they are. They smell great. Okay. Yeah, I want to read the whole book, the lady said. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to let them cool a little bit. Mm -hmm. Before we have our tea. Margie, uh, that, that's our daughter. Mm -hmm. That was so wonderful. She's, she's a high school teacher. Aww. So she appreciate that. <laughs> Do any of you have any questions for Leslie? We'll watch for a few seconds, see if there's any questions there. But uh, what's the, the status of your, your latest endeavors? Well, I've got a new book coming out in September called I Kid You Not. It's actually um, the sequel of the one that was out last year. That was called uh, Are You Kidding Me? And the new book is going to look just like this, uh, except that it's going to be bright, bright blue. Blue, yes. So this one's called I, Are You Kidding Me? And the new one is called I Kid You Not. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's more columns. I, I wrote uh, columns in newspapers and magazines for over 20 years. And so it's a collection of that. And this new one has a lot of uh, pandemic stuff about what it's been like to sit and do nothing. Yes. <laughs> Just stay the blazes home for a year and how it's all driving us crazy oh i know so that's coming out in september and then i have another book coming out in july of 22 and that takes place actually in montreal in 1967 and it's about a 12 year old girl audrey parker she thinks she's a spy so the book is called nosy parker oh well, that sounds wonderful is there any chance that you could uh share with us even are you kidding me or Sure. Well, I have a. I don't have my advanced reading copy of the new one, but this is one of the columns that will be in okay. my new book. Do you okay. want me to do that now? I would, while we're yes, cooling? while that's cooling, oh. that would be lovely. Well, I figured this was a good one since this is a cooking show. Yes. It's called My Stupid Pot. <laughs> <laughs> when I finally, oh, sorry, when I finally got around to mucking up my kitchen, it took me three days because I removed everything off the walls, from inside the cupboards, off the counters, and even took down the window blinds to soak in the bathtub. This was a serious mission, to the point that I removed every last can from the pantry and scoured the inside, even the top shelf that I only had access to with a, with a chair. It's a good thing I did. There was a can of pears from 2003 that had been lurking like nuclear waste in the very back. While I was in this manic state, I decided to biff the items that were no longer serving a purpose. The stuff that I wouldn't dream of handing off to someone else at goodwill. Two pots qualified, and an old electric frying pan that had been languishing under the sink, almost getting moldy. The only reason I hung on to it was because it was my mother's, but I can hear her voice in my head. Don't blame me for the appalling state of that frying pan. It was pristine when I gave it to you. That was always her favorite word, pristine. Well, it's the exact opposite now. So I made a little pile of things no longer serving a purpose and hid them from hubby, who doesn't know about this column and is sitting over there. Uh, because he has an obsessive need to go to make sure nothing is ever thrown out. I've actually gone to the garbage box under the cover of darkness to get rid of something. This is my version of a spy mission. My heart races in case I get caught. The pressure is unreal. So now I only have one small pot and we really need two. There are bigger pots, but if I'm making hard boiled eggs and Cubby wants to steam a few carrots and green beans for himself, we need two before he starts interrogating me on the disappearance of kitchen items. 
The race was on to go to Walmart and stand in front of the shelf of pots. There was another couple speaking German, doing exactly the same thing. Too bad I don't understand German, because I think they were having an argument, and my, I was being naturally nosy, so I was distracted in my own search. I'm blaming this couple for what I ended up with. That and my cheapskate ways are the reasons I picked up a pot that I am now regretting big time. Care and use instructions should always be where you can see them before you buy a product. Once you rip off the plastic gunk covering up the item, it's too late to do anything about it. The small slip of paper saying wash in hot soapy water before using, I was prepared for. But this miserable pot came with an entire full scap sheet of directions. I was tempted not to read it, but once again, my nosy nature did me in and I scanned every line. Boy, am I sorry I did. This lousy pot needs more babysitting than a grandchild. Naturally, the wash in hot soapy water and use a soft cloth was there, as well as making sure to dry completely. But then get this, it's recommended to add a teaspoon of cooking oil prior to each use. For real? That's a couple of Weight Watcher points. There's no way I'm doing that. Never heat an empty cooking utensil. Be sure there is oil, butter, liquid, or food before placing on the range or burner. Well, that's, isn't that what we usually do? That's just silly. But then they blew my socks off. It's not recommended to use on high heat. It's a pot. <laughs> a pot's only used for you to put something in it and boil it as quickly as possible. I'm not gonna stand by my stove gently coaxing this pot to do the one lousy thing it's supposed to do. Who has that kind of time? Cooking on excessive heat can cause warping. Never use utensils with sharp edges. Never use metal scouring pads. Only add salt to the water after it comes to a boil because salt grain deposit on the cookware bottom will attack the metal as the heat melts down. Never put cold water in a hot cooking utensil. If using a ceramic stovetop, lift the pan instead of sliding it across the glass plate. Higher cooking temperatures can cause the handle to get hot. Shine on the coating may become dull and discolored due to the action of certain detergents. Handle may become loose with use. Apparently, this pot is a no-stick sucker, which I never noticed because I was too interested in the arguing duo. Needless to say, I haven't even used this fragile flower of a pot, and I hate it. My plan is to do everything I'm not supposed to do so it will die an early death and stop <laughs> bugging me. And then I'm going down to the bungalow and grab one of my grandmother's old battered pots that have been happily boiling water for 80 years without freaking out and moaning about its precious needs. There. That is amazing, and that is so true. Oh. It's so true. It's ridiculous. Anyway. There now. Thank you very much, you're, Leslie. You're very welcome. I know you love you love her, as you should, and just so you know, there they are over there. That's my sister Bernice. And there's John. There's Hobby. <laughs> I, was telling I promised them I wouldn't do that, but I thought I would. <laughs> so, the, the lemon curd may not be cooled completely, but the tea is on. And um, I've got my table set for my visitors with the teacups just Love those little special memories of, of teacups that were given to you. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> and um, so I am going to take the scone. I'm going to take one for now. And we'll enjoy, after we go off air, uh, I'll have tea with Leslie and Bernice and John. Do you have a... a, a a special place where you like to write. My study, yes. Yes, she has a study where she likes to sit and write. It used to be my son's bedroom, then my daughter's bedroom, and now it's my study. <laughs> there now. Somebody said hi, Bernice, but I, did, I missed the name. <laughs> Aww, I know, I know. It was lovely. So I'm just going to go and take one of these scones off for myself. There they are, they're cooling. And there they are. And they're, they're much darker brown than the ones that I took a picture of. 
uh, you know yeah and um, they smell lemony even from my mistake they turned out okay Lord have mercy but that's what happens when you do something live <laughs> And we'll finish up so uh, hold on a second see how thick it is <clears throat> and I'm going to put a little that's probably just about enough I'm just going to put it right here maybe a little more how's that look all right and I'm going to bring you over here I have a couple of things to talk to you about And I'm going to pour my tea. Mind, I know I, I will. I won't let her near the spoon drawer. Not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pour my tea. And sit down with you. There's my tea, my teacup, and there's money in it. You know what they say, if there's bubbles in it, that means it's money. All right. There we go. Okay. I have to have two bites. Yeah. It's really, really good. Really good. And even with the glaze, it would be so special as well. <clears throat> yes. So next week, we're going to have entertainment. Two young men from West Mabu. Um, they're, they're going to be here. The McQuarrie brothers will be here. Neil and Colin McQuarrie. And they play a lot in the summertime at different uh, locations around here. And uh, they're just two sweethearts. And um, when I asked their mother what what should I make? Is there something special that they like? And they, she said, anything chocolate. So I decided to look through my little elm tree box of recipes. And in there is a recipe that Cecil's mother used to make all the time. And uh, they were called black and white squares. So you make the one batter and then you split it in half and you put cocoa in one and you put coconut in, in the balance of the white and then you put a chocolate frosting and they are really delicious. So that's what I'm gonna be making next week. So you know you have to get medium sweetened coconut and you have to have cocoa and icing sugar and that's, that's all you need uh, to have in. And <laughs> And uh, I also want to talk of interest to those who are in the proximity of St. Martha's Regional Hospital. So many of, of our organizations are just, it's killing them, uh, you know, how, uh, the money that they lose out on when they can't do their fundraising. And who needs hospitals more than this world right now? But um, they have this treat box. Uh, the St. Martha's Hospital. Is it the auxiliary, Bernice? Yes, the auxiliary. 
the it's the St. Martha's Hospital Auxiliary or have these boxes. So this is of interest to those who are, are in the catchment area of St. Martha's Hospital. And um, the boxes are $60, there's no tax, and there's a lot of local products in it. And I have one of the boxes here to show you. But you know, some great local, there's um, McGregor's shortbreads. There is uh, some lavender blueberry tea. There's maple sugar, local maple sugar. Peace by chocolate. There are bars in there. Uh, Gabrio's Bistro in Antigonish. Oh, two delightful products of theirs. There's uh, Bee Sting Honey Mustard. There is All Dressed Spice. And this is a natural, unpasteurized, creamed honey. What a great gift for, for staff uh, who, um, you know, celebrating administrative assistant day. I don't know when that is. It's usually it was in April, but I don't know what people do now. But all you have to do is, is uh, order online at, uh, I'll, I'll post that because it's too long a website. And uh, anything you'd like to add on that, Bernice? No, but it's all of the proceeds. The you pick it up at the hospital. Next all Thursday. proceeds go uh, directly to the the hospital auxiliary, and they do such wonderful work. But uh, you can order them and pick them up next Thursday. So it's a it's a wonderful fundraiser, and a beautiful box, and it's called the Highland Treat Box, and it's a limited edition. Uh, curated by Windfall and features the homemade work of eight Nova Scotia artisans, small businesses. And um, it's great to know that uh, all of the proceeds are going to the auxiliary to, for them to continue to do the work that they do. So uh, if any of you are not aware of that, anybody in the catchment area of St. Martha's Hospital, I hope you'll consider that. God knows they I've been to their progressive care unit a couple of times visiting people and family and um, they're, they're, they're wonderful, all of them, and we need that. I don't think they ship, it's only for pickup only. Uh, just, I can't imagine, it's very heavy. Postage would not work, I can tell you that for sure. So anyway, that's the end of today's show. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I want you to know how special today was to have Leslie Crew here. And um, I want to thank Leslie and, and her driver husband, John, for, for uh, coming the distance from over on the other side of our island and uh, coming to share uh, a reading with us, which we, we do love. And uh, once again, I want to uh, thank you and I want to, to know, as you know, how much you matter to me and I really appreciate everything you write to me and all of those things mean, mean a lot at this time. I had my COVID needle on last week, so I'm so, so happy that that part is done and I get the next one very soon. So, uh, See you next week. Love one another. I love you. Bye-bye, everybody.